Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Phil from the Door of Hope Church here in Maryborough, Queensland, Australia. We pray and hope that these videos and messages are of encouragement to you in your walk with the Lord. Uh, hello to all our people from different regions in the country and the world. Blessings to you from here in Queensland. If you're benefiting from these videos, we'd encourage you to subscribe. And also, if you'd like notification when we upload new videos, we encourage you to ring the bell. If you'd like to make a donation to the ministry, there's a link in the comment section below. We pray and hope from the whole team here at Door of Hope that you be blessed by these videos. Okay, before we come to the Word, let's pray so that the Holy Spirit will give us guidance and illuminate the truth to us. Jesus, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for coming and speaking and showing yourself to us. We thank you, Father, for revealing yourself through the prophets. Thank you, Lord, that we have had faithful men who have given up their life so that we can have your word in English in this Bible here to study it and to understand it. So I pray, Holy Spirit, come and illuminate the truth to us in your wonderful name. Amen. Now, just to remind you that... If I ever go to the application of the word, I do that simply as an example. And I'm never actually doing that to say to you, this is what you need to do. So the way this works is you, you study the scriptures to find out what does it mean? What does that text, what's it actually saying? What does it mean? Then you, once you've worked out the meaning, you think about, well, what's the implication of that? And then once you understand the implication, you think about the application, which is what am I going to do? So the reason I don't tend to go to the application is because we're all at different places, different cultures, uh, different genders, different ages, different experiences, different challenges, different problems. So if I start saying this is how you apply it, well that, that's obviously then how I apply that truth. I'll give you the example I used was that, that verse that says that uh, the whole world is under the sway of Satan. Now what does that mean? It means that Satan is affecting things in the world. It doesn't mean that everything in the world is evil, of course not, but he's working in amongst it. So the implication then is if you just wholeheartedly receive what comes from the world without any discernment, you are going to be influenced by Satan through the world. The application I went to is don't watch so much television, read more of your Bible. Now that's just an example of how you might apply that truth. In no way am I saying to anyone stop watching television oh, you know so understand in your mind whenever I'm talking about an application I'm only doing it to give an example to the implication and the understanding of the text never feel that I'm telling you you must do xyz that's between you and God my job is to help us understand what the text actually means Today I'm going to be doing two parts and hopefully I get far enough through it I want to just fly over what we did yesterday because I want to give you the evidence and understanding that the, uh, who the Antichrist is, is what we're working on because I believe he's in the world. There's a sheet like this which is on that table just here, so on the way out you can grab that sheet. It has a summary to this point in time of all the things that we are looking for to be able to identify the Antichrist. Now a few of you weren't here so let me explain how this works. As soon as I say Antichrist, you're thinking of the Hollywood version of um, some guy who's going to rule the world and you've got a stamp on your forehead and when some people have talked to me and said when they were kids they used to get the texter and 666 on their forehead and all you know Hollywood ideas imaginative ideas it's not what the Bible says how many movies have you ever watched about Noah or something where you've gone I don't remember him saying that I don't remember that happening <laughs> especially that one with Russell Crowe in it <laughs> Okay, so where we start is we go to the text and find out what does the Bible tell us about the Antichrist. Now, the reason we are doing this is there is one prophetic verse in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 that we're working on which identifies the beginning of the tribulation and it says, He confirms a covenant with many for one week, in Daniel 9, 27. That's the verse we are actually looking at and have been looking at and all we're trying to do at this stage is figure out who the He is, one word within that verse. Because when you can figure out who the he is, you can keep an eye on him and then watch him to see where does he further strengthen or establish an existing covenant and he does that for seven years. So we've been looking at how to identify the Antichrist. I'm just going to fly through a few things. The more, 
you know, I gave a lot more information about the slides I'm going to go through on Saturday, but I just, because not everybody here gets to see that, I just want to run through it fairly quickly. Last um, week, we went through this, which is a section of identifying the Antichrist. These are the passages of Scripture we have covered to this point and the sort of things that come out of it. So from 1 John, 2 John, 2 Thessalonians, we've established so far that this Antichrist is another Christ, a replacement Christ, a different Christ and is against the true Christ. So a lot of people have the attitude the Antichrist is, is just going to be this world political military power that's going to oppress Christianity. John actually says, no, actually he comes out of us and he is from us. So therefore the Antichrist comes from Christianity and we did this all last time. False teaching specifically as it applies to the nature of Jesus and true salvation. Uh, he, uh, he has been present since John's time but a final one appears. All this we've just got straight out of the text. The man of sin, the son of perdition will be revealed. He opposes the true God, exalts himself to be God receives worship and exalts himself above others. He sits in the temple of God while sitting in the church or church or temple, he shows himself to be God on earth. We're just getting it straight out of the text and we're on, that's only about a quarter of the information that is in Scripture, how to identify the Antichrist. So don't listen to the Hollywood movies, don't go into your vain imagination, study the text. God has told us quite clearly, this man is very easy to identify. There is a lot of information about him. I've highlighted and un underlined there, he sits in the temple of God. Now, some people are expecting a, a temple to be built and some Christians I talk to say, uh, oh, it's, he's, Jesus is not going to return, the temple needs to be built. Well, that may be true and may not be true. This is what you have to always watch. What is your interpretation? You're, you're getting a meaning out of it. So where it says uh, in those verses we read, he sits in the temple of God, claiming himself to be God, then people take that word temple and think a literal temple but there is plenty of scripture that shows that the church is the temple of God and those scriptures are there on the screen we did all this yesterday so I'm just uh, going through it so therefore the body of Christ the church can be considered the temple of God so just interpreting the text we don't have to see a physical temple because in the middle of the tribulation he causes sacrifice and offering to cease it's us the body of Christ who offer sacrifice of praise and serve and uh, do that today. We are the house of God, we are the temple of God, the one and only true church in the world. So you don't have to have a physical, literal temple in Israel, but that is a possibility. So remember, we're not trying to predict things, what we're trying to do is learn what the prophecy actually says. Now I'm going to... This one here, Daniel chapter 2, this is the uh, image... Head of gold was King Nebuchadnezzar, then it went from gold to silver to bronze to iron and his iron legs and iron feet of the Roman Empire and the little rock, the rock that was cut without human hands is the return of Christ who will come and destroy the image, Daniel chapter 2. That's all online if, you, if that's all new to you and you want to learn more. But this, Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. Yesterday we looked at Daniel chapter 7 Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7 are parallel prophecies about these four kingdoms. So really they're the same prophecy just given in a different way. Daniel 7 gives us more information than Daniel 2. So the first empire was the Babylonian empire, then the Medo-Persians, then the Greek and then the Roman empire. The legs of the statue in Daniel 2 are made of iron and he has ten toes. The creature, the fourth creature in Daniel chapter 7 is a creature of iron who has ten horns. So out of that, out of the Roman Empire comes ten kingdoms. Ten toes of the image in Daniel 2, uh, ten horns on, on the creature in Daniel 7 and these ten kingdoms appear again in Revelation because we haven't got that far. So who are the ten kingdoms that have come out of the fall of the Roman Empire? So we went through, when you, when you look through Daniel 7, all this information comes out of it. So all this has been added, all this has been added to the sheet that's on the table. In Daniel chapter 7, let me just summarise it for you. There are 10 kingdoms that came out of the collapse of the Roman Empire. And the verse says that there's this little horn, so 10 kingdoms are established, a little horn rises up and three of the horns are plucked out before it. 
And on that little horn, he has eyes and a mouth speaking pompous words. That's why we're able to identify the little horn as the Antichrist, because it matches Thessalonians, where he says he sets himself up in the temple of God, claiming to be God, speaking blasphemy. So in, da- in Daniel 7, it says that this little horn speaks pompous words against the Most High. So in other words, he is claiming to be God. So we know from the way this is written that with the Antichrist claims to be God. That's the pompous words he speaks against the Most High. So the little horn in Daniel 7. So that means you can have a look on the Bible history chart over there on the wall to check this out later, that when Rome collapsed, there were 10 kingdoms. Three of those were destroyed by a Roman general who was working with the papal see at that time to establish papal authority and he ripped up three of those kingdoms or destroyed three of those kingdoms and gave it to the Pope because he became a Roman Catholic and he used his military power and political power to establish the papacy and it's at that point in time that the papacy went from being different than all the other kingdoms because that's what it also says, different. Different in what way? The papal see is different than any other kingdom because it is a monarchy but it's also a democracy. The Pope is voted into power and then once he's in power, he's like a dictator or a a monarchy, he rules. And then they have land, they have kingdom, they have their own army. Everything about the papacy fits Daniel 7, which we're going to, I'm going to give all this to you over time. So, for those who weren't here, the other prophecy talks about the 70-week prophecy. You have seven weeks or seven by seven, 49 up until the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the walls in Jerusalem, then you have another 62 weeks on top of that until Messiah Christ is cut off, then you have this approximately 2,000 years until the return of Christ and at the end you have the tribulation week. I've been through all of this, this is just to get our thinking right. Skip this, it's going to take too long to get through that. There's two things that also line up with two things that also line up with this about the tribulation week that is what's called the redemptive week you have you ever wondered why the millennial reign is a thousand years it's because it's a thousand years of rest for the world it's the forced sabbath rest of the land so scholars see the the, this um redemptive week you have one two three four five six thousand years and then you have one thousand years forced sabbath rest of the land So the story of Genesis becomes more prophetic than scientific, that it gives this pattern. That's why the Sabbath rest is in the commandments. So you have all those years, you can see where Noah fits in and Abraham and Daniel and so forth. Then you've got the first coming of Christ after about 4,000 years, second coming of Christ after 6,000 years where he establishes the millennial reign. All the information about that is online. Another big prophecy that puts all this in, and they're all coming to the same point. This is why I'm just quickly showing you this. This is not just one prophecy. Daniel 9, 27, he confirms a covenant with many for one week. It's just not one isolated thing. There are prophecies all over scripture that are all intersecting at this point in time. So Israel, the fig tree, that's where uh, he who is alive and begins to see this will be alive when the time comes. So Israel has been restored. So there's been 1,948 days multiplied by 80, how all that works, Matthew 24, 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree, when its branch has already become under tender and puts forth leaves, you know the summer is near, so you also, when you see all these things, that's the restoration of Israel, that's the fig tree coming back to life, So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And when you go read that in context, that's Matthew 24, where Jesus was talking about his return. So therefore, the restoration of Israel, one generation from the restoration of Israel, everything will take place. 1948 is the year that people uh, say that Israel was re-established. In the scripture it talks about in Psalm 90 there about a man's life is 70 years by reason of strength 80 years so you add 80 years to 948, 2028 around that time the return of Christ. Come back from that time seven years we're in 2021. Come back to this year the Antichrist which I'm about to show you has confirmed a further covenant with many and he's done it for exactly seven years which is why I'm talking about it. This is why I can't keep this information to myself any longer. I've always been happy to just leave prophecy to the side as a bit of a hobby but I need to give it to you. 
So, all of that is happening, all of that is online and you can see that. I just wanted to quickly go through some of that. You can turn that off now, thanks, Alan. Go through some of that so that those who don't make it on Saturday can get a quick idea of the sort of thing we cover. What I want to cover more on Sundays is what on earth are you going to do? We're coming into the tribulation, so it's not just knowing that that's happening, it's also what do I do, okay? Phil, great, we're in the tribulation, things are going to get bad, what on earth do I do? That's what I want to cover more on Sundays. So, if you turn with me, I'm going to look at um, probably three sections of scripture, Matthew chapter 6, James chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 3. So if you turn first of all to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. How do you set yourself up in, in readiness for all that is coming on the face of the earth? You know, most of it won't be any different than what a mature, strong Christian would be doing. But if you look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, the Gentiles being non-believers seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Now, I'm going to preach something right now that is completely opposite to the prosperity gospel. But I want to make sure that you understand that I'm not saying that poverty equals godliness. So, in other words, you can't become holy by selling all your possessions, getting rid of everything you own and have a backpack on and it's just you and your backpack. That does not get you any closer to God. It does not make you any holier. This is talking about an attitude of heart of whom do you serve. Very similar to what you've already heard this morning, do I serve Satan, do I serve Jesus, do I serve myself or do I serve Jesus? So here, it's people who are taking on the worry of the things of this world. And it says, do not worry. But how many people worry about things that aren't even on that list? On that list, it talks about what I shall eat, what I shall drink, and what I shall wear. It doesn't say worry about your Ferrari or your boat or your house or your trip to France. It doesn't say any of that sort of stuff. That is, that is Western culture. So don't, don't morph Christianity into Western culture, you'll get a distorted understanding of what true salvation and true spirit, spirituality is. Remember how I said Satan uh, influences the people of this world. So if you just take your Western culture and Christianize it, you end up with a distortion of the gospel. As a matter of fact, you end up with something that's not the gospel. And you hear this preached. God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. Come to Jesus and ask Jesus into your life and he will and fill in the gap. He will help you with your marriage, he'll help you with your job, he'll help you with... In other words, what they've done is they've distorted the true gospel and morphed it with modern Western Christianity and made something that it's not. What it says here is the word is quite clear. Seek first, that means above everything else, God's kingdom. So not, not your kingdom. Not your possessions, not your life. So the hard attitude is Jesus comes first. His kingdom comes first. I have to seek that kingdom first. And notice that it's not just seek the kingdom of God, it says the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek righteousness. Now, if, I don't know whether this is an old story, but I watched the 60 Minute Report on what's been happening with Brian Houston and uh, Hillsong. We sort of grew up at that era with Brian Houston. I remember him when he was preaching because we were back in the AOG in those days as a young minister. I tell you, he started off a lot different than what he is now. Why? Because you start to add the world into Christianity and you get something else. That's exactly what this is saying. Don't turn your Christianity into a cultural, cultural version of Christianity. Your, your gospel, your truth, 
has to be able to be taken from where you are and shared with anyone anywhere around the world in any state or any condition. So how would you take that gospel to somebody starving to death in an Indian slum? You, it just doesn't fit, does it? All right? But the gospel of Jesus Christ does. Because when you go to anyone, anywhere, in any state, no matter how rich, no matter how poor, no matter how healthy or sick, the gospel is simply this. Do you want to get right with God? And the only way for you to get right with God is through and in Jesus Christ. No matter who you are, whoever shall come to the Lord can be saved. So therefore, come to Jesus and surrender your life to him. Let him save you. Save you from what? Save you from the wretchedness of your sin. That you have, you have acted in a way that has separated you from a holy God. And he is holy, and he is just, and he is righteous. He can't just turn a blind eye to the things you've done. You, you can turn over a fresh leaf right now and say, well, I'm going to be better from here, but what about the stuff you've already done? He can't just sweep that under the carpet. He's a holy God. It has to be dealt with. So when you come to God, if you come to God and say, Lord, I believed in you and I, I prayed that you would help me with my marriage and my job and everything, he said, yeah, but did you seek after righteousness? Did you seek after an, a, an attitude and a behaviour within yourself that was like mine? Did you pursue those things which were of my kingdom or did you pursue the things that were of your own self-interest? So seek first the kingdom of God. Now, you can't do this in a token way. You can't sort of manipulate God and because it says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, uh, for tomorrow has its own worries. But if you seek God and seek his righteousness, he will add to you what you need. You will have food, you will have drink, you will have clothes. You have what you need. You don't need that other stuff. You need whatever Christ says you need. But you can't do this in a token way. You can't sort of like put Jesus on the shelf and sort of say, well, I asked Jesus into my heart back in 1984. And yeah, we, we had a great revival back then. Oh, it was great, good stuff. And yeah, I believe in Jesus. But you, but you know you're not living for him now. That's what matters. Are you seeking the kingdom of God now? Are you serving Jesus now? Because it's what, what's in front of you that really matters. Push forward into what God has for you. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up to do with the tribulation is that you are going to get manipulated by Satan through the things of this world. So if you still have self, if you still have a need for material possessions, if you still have a need for things, he is going to manipulate you through that. And you're going to be put in a compromising position where you feel you can't but. Remember what it says in the middle of the tribulation. It causes all great and small rich and poor and he goes to great length to say basically everyone in the world will need to become part of this system and you will need to become part of this system if you want to buy and sell in other words if you want to have your house and have your trip you're going to have to become part of the system and so he's going to manipulate you to sacrifice something of your faith in order to do it because it says that, that when you receive that mark whatever that mark is and it doesn't have to be a tattoo on your head and it doesn't have to be a chip under your hand I'll get to all of that. But when you make the decision to take that in order to get this, then it's that getting, that's where the weakness is in your life. That you haven't surrendered your life, that you're not living for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You're actually adding Jesus to your life and you're pursuing the things of this world and Satan has an inroad through that and you're going to compromise things because of that. Exactly opposite to what a lot of preachers say, come to Jesus and he'll help you with you, you get more money. Make a good donation to the stuff out the back that we're doing and Jesus will multiply it to you and you'll, you'll get plenty of money. I don't see it in here, sorry. That's westernised Christianity. Jump with me up to James chapter 5. After Hebrews, Hebrews, James chapter 5. Actually, chapter 4. He, James chapter 4, verse 1. I'll just read from 1 to 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they, do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members... War comes from the desire within our fallen nature... 
You lust and you do not have. You murder and you covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have, because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. How many people are praying for things and they're asking amiss, because it's really in the lust for possessions, it's in the lust for power, it's in the lust for significance, it's in the lust for purpose and meaning, and through that lust you're praying for things and you're praying and asking God and he says you're not getting your answer. Why? Because you're asking amiss. You're asking for it on yourself. You're still, it's still all about you. Now, haven't you realised that salvation is actually not about you? Salvation is about Jesus Christ, that he is glorified in your salvation and that you happen to be the blessed recipient of the life that he gives you because of the love of God the Father for the Son and the Son for the Father and you're stuck in the middle of it that Jesus died in humble obedience to the Father that you may live and the, and the Father receives all those that are in Christ Jesus because he is his Son. You know, you enter into salvation because of Jesus Christ and because of the Father. You're not the, cent- you're not the central figure in this. So many, Christ- so many preachers are sort of helping Christians think you're the centre of everything. You're not the centre of everything. Jesus Christ is the centre of everything. And so therefore we become the blessed recipients of being in Christ. Praise God. Because otherwise we'd have no hope, no future. So therefore don't pray for things that are of this world. Pray and seek for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But listen to what it says in verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? So if you befriend the world and the ways of the world, because remember Satan is the God of this world and he sways this world, if you enter into the ways of this world with all its lust for power and significance and money and whatever else, then you make yourself an enemy of God. There it is in the text. So how can people say that coming to Jesus is about you getting rich? When it says if you pursue the things of this world, you become an enemy of God. Why? Because you are not pursuing his kingdom and his righteousness. Jesus died that we may be restored to God in a relationship with him and that we will be with him forever, we'll serve and reign with him in the millennium and then forever with Christ into eternity with him on the throne. Not me, not you. We're the blessed recipients of salvation. Praise God. We're going to be in the glory of God. We're going to see the glory of God. We're going to be filled with the glory of God. Why? To his praises. Because there'll be nothing of myself where I could go. And it says that, doesn't it? Ephesians 4. No one will be able to boast in anything. I won't be able to boast because I sought the Lord. I won't be able to boast because I prayed. I won't be able to boast because I went to church. I won't be able to boast because I did good deeds. None of that counts for anything. Somebody who worked far more than you or I, the Apostle Paul, who was a zealot uh, Pharisee, far more pure, holy and religious than any of us would ever be. And he said, I count all that as just, I can't say it here, I would say it in the street. That thing you do when you go to the toilet. I count all that as, that'll do. That's a more pleasant word, isn't it? Dung. I'm used to preaching to wake people up <laughs> he counts it as so, so when you think about your works when you come to the Lord you realise he's not looking for me to become perfect in something that's acceptable to him he's not, he's not looking for me to do anything what he's looking for me to do is die and be buried into Christ so that in Christ I can have eternal life James chapter 5, no actually still 4, chapter 4 verse 13, chapter 4 verse 13, come now you who say today and tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. So in other words people who are planning their life, you're planning your retirement, you're planning your holiday, you're planning, see if you're, if you're, sold your soul into the plan you have and the tribulation comes that you'll be challenged to compromise your faith in order to keep pursuing your plan which is your plan is about the things of this world 
Because it says, Come now, you who say, Today and tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. You could be dead tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapour that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So in other words, the short time you have, the small time you have, do you really want to be pursuing the things of this world and building up for yourself riches in this world where moth and rust can sort of destroy them all and you can lose them all? I know people in business who have worked their whole life to make a multi-million dollar corporation and then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, you know, lost the whole lot. And then they go and commit suicide because that was their life. So now that's, that's somebody who has millions of dollars in a multinational company, but that, now bring the same principles down to you and I with your job and your money and your house. You see, because even though it's smaller, it's still of the world. Now, I'm not saying, no way, don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying don't work. I've worked hard all my life and we have a house and we're, we're doing things because I'm working towards that for a home, food on the table, somewhere to live. But the priority has to be Jesus. So if that... If, if for whatever reason I can't have that, it just goes away. I don't really care. I don't care whether I have it or not. What I care about is when Jesus returns that he says, well done, good and faithful servant. So therefore I've got to surrender my life to Jesus Christ in service to Jesus Christ and you need to do the same thing. That peace that passes all understanding that we will have in the middle of great tribulation comes not from the things of this world, but from the certainty that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, risen from the dead, and that we have the confirmation of that in us by the Holy Spirit, and we have the reliable account of the truth according to the word that gives us peace and confidence that we are in Christ and destined for eternity in Christ. So therefore, who cares about the things of this world? I'll still work to build a house, I'll still put food on the table and everything like that, but it's not my heart's desire, it's not the master I serve. Verse chapter 5. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and the corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. We are coming towards the end. What, what generation would this ever apply to than this one? You know, I have information that 1,810 people in the world own 70% of the world's wealth. Those 1,810 people own 70% of the whole world's wealth. Wow, exactly. They, if they were of God, could solve poverty in the world overnight. So the sin rests with humanity. God, you know, like if we truly cared for each other but of course we don't we know why we don't because when you're not in Christ you are a self-centered wretched sinner and you're going to pursue whatever lust and desire satisfies your carnal nature you have no reason to care for anyone else if you do care for somebody else it's only in the end to satisfy your corrupted need Jesus Christ being born again of the spirit means something happens in you where you actually care about people and things and situations that it's not coming from you It's coming from Christ in you by the Holy Spirit. Why do you care for that person down there? They mean, that would mean nothing to a carnal person in the world, but you care because Christ is in you. And Jesus came into the world willingly, obediently from the kingdom of heaven that whoever may may call on his name will be saved. He cares for them. So that means he is rising up within you to say, talk to them, feed them, help them. That's why it's evidence of salvation, the manifestation of Christ in you. The hope of glory for those people. Last days. Now, just because I'm running out of time, let's jump up to Revelation chapter 3 just to close with. Revelation chapter 3, many believe that this is the the last church, that the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 talk about the different phases of church history over time. And the last church is prophetic. Matches what I just read in James 5 and more of James 5 about the wealth the, the corrupt wealth of the last days. But this is the same problem in the seventh church in Revelation chapter 3. So we're from Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, 
that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Now I've heard of many preachers allegorise what being hot and cold is. The text tells us what being, hot, being lukewarm is. Being lukewarm means that you are saying to yourself, I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. That is the lukewarmness that he's talking about. That is the prophecy of the last times. That is what we see when we're preaching down in the street. People who have their cars, walk in, get their coffee, their clothes, they're, they're, I have what I need. Why do I need God? Become lukewarm. Because they say within their own heart, I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Why do I need God? I don't need God. And the corrupt nature of men that won't even respond to God because it says... Uh, in Romans chapter 3 to 6, it talks about how no one seeks after God. You know, a man's corrupt heart is not something that seeks after God. So I've been sharing with a guy who's coming to faith and he wants to be baptised once he can overcome a bit of anxiety, so pray for him. But he realised, as I was sharing this with him, that means God has already been working in my life because why am I spending time with you reading scripture and talking about Jesus? Why on earth would I do that? You're doing that because the Spirit of God is already at work in you, giving you a desire for himself. So if you were here today on Sunday where you could be down the beach, you could be off fishing, you could be four-wheel driving, you could be doing whatever, but you're sitting here, to the natural man, that's insanity. Do you mean you spend your Sunday morning going down and listen to that guy? Why? Because the Spirit of God is in you and you're hearing the Word of God and it's life to you. That's evidence of salvation, to love the church, to love the word of God and to seek after God and to seek after his righteousness, not the things of this world. So the people of the last day who say that though I am rich and have become wealthy and have no need of anything and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Now it's not talking literal gold, that you may be rich and white garments, that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Now, that, that shame of your nakedness goes right back to the garden. What did they do after they sinned? They covered their nakedness, their shame. So if you feel ashamed, and many people feel ashamed when we preach about coming to, and you think about coming to church, I can't walk into church, I'm ashamed. If people actually knew what I had done. If people, you know, and you've got these images in your head of past things that you've been involved in and you feel the shame Jesus can take that shame away why because he will put into your heart righteousness that's why it says seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness because there there is life Satan only comes to steal and to kill and destroy the lust of men but Jesus said, I have come to give life and to give it more abundantly. That's eternal life in Christ Jesus. The shame is gone. I don't need to even remember those images because as far as I'm concerned, they're just washed away by the blood of Jesus. So from here on, it's got to be about Jesus Christ, his kingdom and his righteousness, that I am progressively becoming more sanctified, that I'm progressively working day and day with the Holy Spirit and with the word of God to become more and more like Jesus Christ in my life. That means that when the tribulation comes, if you're able to live that, that the things of this world cannot be used of Satan to manipulate you into compromising your faith. And some of you may even be convicted today, now, that you know that you've compromised your faith because of the things of this world. You need to take care of that. That's between you and God. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And all of us here, Lord, just make that prayerful commitment to surrender ourselves afresh to you. Lord, we want you to be the head of this church. We want you to be the head of our life. We want you to be the righteousness that is in us. Come, Jesus, I pray, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Be in us as a people. Let us be your temple in the world. Help us, Jesus, to share with our family and our friends. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to all that you call us to. Help us, Lord, to be fully equipped for the trouble that is coming on the world. Lord, that we can share a message that will bring life to many, to the glory of your name. Amen.